aren't able to stay on the entire time, you could watch it on YouTube later. So Father God, we thank you so much for this day today. Thank you so much for declaring us blessed and blessing our life, Lord. Thank you so much for the revelation, the wisdom and the knowledge that you have in store for us, that you have ready to impart into us as your children. And we just thank you so much, Father, for allowing us to be here today, to be gathered as the body of Christ. And we are truly hungry for more of you, Father. So I just pray that you pour out your love and pour out your spirit here like never before. And we just declare that every bit of confusion sent from the camp of the enemy is destroyed. Anything that the enemy would try to plant as a seed here, it is destroyed in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So th this is the message that the Lord just has so heavy on my spirit to share with you guys. We need to we need to understand where our faith is grounded. Where do you have your faith grounded? And this is so important for us to think about because the enemy, he wants to steal, kill, and destroy, right? But he doesn't just want to steal, kill, and destroy our earthly possessions and things, but he wants to take away the very thing that connects us to the Spirit of God, which is our faith. So if you do not have strong faith in God, then it's going to be easy for the enemy to come in, bring confusion, bring doubt, and just throw you off course. And I just truly pray that God will pour out his spirit on you and that nothing can shake you, that when the devil is whispering lies in your ears, that you will not fall for it, that you will recognize that he just wants to steal your faith from you. And that is pretty much the message that the Lord has placed on my heart to share with you guys. And we know that Faith is what pleases God. Faith is what connects us to the spirit of God. The whole basis and foundation of our belief and Christianity is faith, the faith that we have in God. So ask yourself, where does my faith come from? Does my faith come from what people have told me? Does it come from God blessing me, my experiences? Or is it rooted in the foundation of Jesus Christ? Because deception is so real today and when deception comes into your mind and you do not have that strong foundation it's going to be easy for the enemy to come in and knock you down so just try to figure out where your faith is rooted from and just really hold on to it and thank god that you have that faith in him because faith is truly a gift and it's a gift from god so now let's let's get into the topic that I know a lot of you guys are hungry for, which is the topic of dreams. So there is truly so much power in prophetic dreams. And most dreams that we have truly are prophetic. I know many of you on here today are dreamers. I know for myself, some nights I literally feel like I have like 15, 20 dreams a night, which is honestly just crazy because when we are sleeping, the spirit of God is speaking to us and we need to be inclined to what he is telling us. So through this study, I really hope that you guys are able to gain that understanding because this topic could definitely be a lot. It can definitely be a lot, you know, and through our dreams, God is making us aware of our spiritual atmosphere, of what is happening around us, what we normally do not see with our physical eyes. And this is so, so important because the spiritual world is even more real than the physical world. And let me just tell you guys right now, I will give you guys time for questions at the end, but I am not going to be interpreting everybody's dreams today just keep it try to keep it simple when it comes to the questions um let me see amen 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 so this this topic is gonna be packed so get ready have your pens and your papers ready 
and let's get into it. So when we are sleeping, right, and we are dreaming, God is only exposing to us what is already occurring or he is exposing to us what is to come. So through our dreams, we can get a current projection and a future projection of what is currently happening in our life. And I just love this because this even this this is even more. How, what, what word could I use? This is even more proof that God, he truly does not want us to be in the dark. You know, Luke 8, 17 says, for nothing is secret that will not be revealed, nor anything hidden that will not be known and come to light. You know, so if you see a lot of darkness surrounding you, if you see a lot of darkness surrounding you in your dreams, or trying to bind you in your dreams, the Lord is warning you and he is showing you what is happening. And another thing we need to do, we need to ask the Lord, what action needs to be taken from what is being revealed? When we are receiving these dreams, these are also revelations from God. And let's let's really understand this too bad dreams are not always necessarily a demonic attack that you need to fight off sometimes it's truly God's way of showing you what you need to look out for so it's not always just like a demon trying to torment you or something you know and I think this is kind of where it could get confusing because when we are having these dreams that could sometimes seem terrifying that does not mean that these things have already come to pass Sometimes God is just trying to show us what we need to look out for. And this is why we also have to keep in mind that our dreams truly is something that we shouldn't just brush to the side. And when we have dreams, this is another point. When we have dreams where we're doing something that we normally wouldn't do, that can be a sign of witchcraft. So we know that witchcraft is a manipulation tactic that is used by the kingdom of darkness. Welcome in, welcome in, Monique. Thank you so much for joining. So witchcraft is used so heavily by the kingdom of darkness. It is basically the things, the thing that is largely used by the kingdom of darkness to come after the people of God. So when you see yourself in your dreams doing something that you know you would not normally do, don't start to think that that is actually you. Like this is actually something that you are doing yourself, but it's actually God showing you that the enemy is trying to manipulate you into doing a specific thing. And I could use an example of myself where I told you guys last Saturday that a huge issue in my life was marijuana and when I was set free and delivered from marijuana I had a few honestly a few dreams where I saw myself using it and I I knew like I don't even have this desire God he brought me to the point where I even like I could smell it and it would have like a, a horrible stench to me it was something that I could not take so the enemy was just trying to bring me into a place of temptation. And that that's what God was showing me through my dreams. So that that's an example that I have for you guys. And this is another thing that we have to remember. The interpretation of dreams comes from the spirit of God alone. Yes, the interpretation of dreams comes from the spirit of God alone. And this, this is revealed in Genesis 40 verses 8 where Joseph was talking to the two men that wanted to tell them his dream their dreams because they had these horrible dreams that were concerning to them and he was going to basically give them the meaning so it says they said to him and this is Genesis 48 Genesis chapter 40 verses 8 so they said to him we have had dreams and there is no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? 
So he says, do not interpretations belong to God. Please tell them to me. So Joseph, he was confident in his ability to interpret dreams because as we will go through later, the Lord blesses people with the ability to interpret dreams. So we, we're going to go through a lot today. And this is just some of what we will go through. God speaks to us in dreams. Yes, God speaks to us in dreams. And I know some people think that dreams are just random. Some dreams are random, yes, but the Spirit of God definitely does speak to us in dreams. And it's not something that we should just brush off. We need to recognize when the Spirit of God is speaking us, speaking to us in our dreams so that we can take action. God, when he speaks, he he has a reason for it. So when we look in Job chapter 33, verses 14 through 16, it says, For God speaks in one way and in two, though man does not perceive it. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls upon men, while they slumber in their beds. Then he opens the ears of men and terrifies them with warnings. Yes, it says he terrifies them with warnings. So sometimes we're having these dreams that seem to be so terrifying and we think that they're just these demonic attacks. But no, sometimes it really is just God sending us a warning. So the next thing, God sends angels to help us through our dreams. So just think about it. Have you seen an angel helping you in your dreams ever? When these when these angels come to us in our dreams, sometimes they will look like just regular humans, but in your interaction with the angel in your dream, you will just know that it is an angel. And sometimes they will say that they are an angel that has been sent to help you. So the next thing, God, he can give us future projections of our life through our dreams, just like I mentioned earlier. He can give these, he can give us these future projections. And this is almost a way of him revealing to us what is to come before it actually happens? Because like we read in Luke, for nothing is hidden that will not be revealed. So let's really try to think about it as well. What has God revealed to you in your dreams that is a future projection that you may not have recognized as a future projection? So the next thing, which is a big one, covenants can be made in our dreams covenants can be made in our dreams and we will go over that as well an example that we will go over is the covenant made with abraham in genesis 15 so the next thing to remember god he imparts to us we can receive impartation in our dreams and when we look at the definition of impart, it means to communicate the knowledge of something, to make known, to show by words or tokens. So to communicate knowledge of something, to make known, to show by words or tokens. So impartation is something that is huge that God does for us as his people. And it truly is a, a really big blessing that we should not take for granted, you know. The next thing, God blesses people with the gift of dream interpretation. So some dreams, they truly can be very difficult to interpret, even when you are trying to interpret it with the Spirit of God, with the Holy Spirit, it can still be confusing. And this is why we together as the body of Christ, need to work together and allow the power of God to do what it does. You know, let him do what he does and do not take advantage of people for their gifts, but do not feel bad about, you know, going to someone to help you because let's remember a gift is not just for yourself. When God has gifted us 
with specific things. It is truly so that we can be a help to others. So whenever you need help with, you know, interpreting a dream, when you know someone in the body of Christ that can interpret dreams, don't be scared to go to them. And when you are in the body of Christ and you have a gift, you know that it just feels amazing when you use that gift for the glory of God. So we're going to go over that. We're going to see how Daniel and Joseph had the gift of dream interpretation. So the next thing, some dream messaging that we receive can disturb or trouble us in our spirit. So when we have certain dreams, we can indeed be disturbed or troubled in our spirit, but that does not mean that that dream did not come from God. A lot of people say that most times God, he will give us peace. Yes, God gives us peace, but God also gives us warning. Like we saw in, what was it, Job 33, 14 through 16, let me read it again. Let's be reminded. It says, For God speaks in one way and in two, though man does not perceive it, in a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls upon men, while they slumber in their beds. Then he opens the ears of men and terrifies them. He terrifies them with warnings. Because some situations that we face in life, there is an urgency to it. And with that urgency comes action. So God knows that as humans, sometimes he needs to shake us up so that we can take action. So the next thing, God also uses symbols to relay messages to us in our dreams. So these symbols can be things that we use in our everyday life, things that are familiar to us. He's going to use symbols that are familiar to us because these are things that we will be able to recognize. But it can still be confusing sometimes. Let's be honest. When God is showing us symbols in our dreams, sometimes you'll see like a ketchup bottle next to a notebook or something. And then you're just like, God, what is this? What are you trying to show me? And then you have to work with the Holy Spirit who will reveal to you what the meaning of the dream was. So these things are things that we will be able to recognize, but we still have to learn how to decipher it and put the pieces together with the Spirit of God. So the next thing, we will not always understand our dreams in the beginning, but let's recognize that it is okay Let's say you had a dream last night and you're just like, God, what was that about? I don't know what that was about. God, he will reveal the meaning to you in due time. Sometimes, let's let's be real, we want the answer immediately and right away. But sometimes God, he will reveal it to you after it's been some time. So this is also why it can be really helpful to write down your dreams or record what you have dreamed if it's something that you know is very important or even if it's not something that you think is important still try to write it down and record it and see what God will reveal to you later because just because he doesn't reveal it to you right now doesn't mean that he's not going to reveal it to you in a few days or even you may just randomly have a revelation of what the dream meant after so a certain situation unfolded in your life. So I need to get better at that as well, writing down all of my dreams. But I'm telling you guys, I know that some of you know what I'm talking about, where we, we have like 15, 20 dreams a night, it seems. So it's just so much. But just try to write down what you can remember and try to write it down immediately so that you do not forget because sometimes we wake up we go about our day and then we try to think about what the dream was and then we just completely forgot about it. So definitely try to get to it right when it happens, which can also be kind of difficult too because you're tired and you just don't feel like doing that. But I think it definitely is beneficial in the end. So I, I have some questions that I think we should be asking ourselves. 
when we have these dreams <laughs> yeah when you have like 10 dreams a night it's like okay i don't know but these are these are questions that we should ask ourselves whether we fully understand the dream or not okay whether we fully understand the dream or not these are questions that we should be asking god what action should i be taking so when God reveals something to us, it is not just for us to have the knowledge of it, but most of the time there is an action that is supposed to happen after, which we will get into later on when we start reading some scriptures. And the next one, is there anything we should be asking God, is there anything that you want me to do with what has been revealed? So we should be asking God, is there anything that you want me to do with what has been revealed? And again, this is important because we know the type of world that we live in. We know that the enemy is always seeking to steal, kill, destroy, and devour the things of God in our life. So we want to be on top of it. And it's truly a privilege and a blessing to be able to be connected to the Spirit of God and hear anything from God. So let's not take these things for granted. And now I want us to define what a dream means. So in the KJV dictionary, it says the thought or series of thoughts of a person in sleep. So the thought or series of thoughts of a person in sleep. We apply dream in the singular to a series of thoughts which occupy the mind of a sleeping person in which he imagines he has a view of real things or transactions. A dream is a series of thoughts not under the command of reason and hence wild and irregular. So yes, hence wild and irregular. The things that we do in our dreams, most times we cannot do it in the physical realm. We see ourselves sometimes doing crazy things that we're just like, if we were to do that in the physical realm, we would probably be injured or something. And let's really keep it basic and simple. Who has dreams? Everyone has dreams. So because everyone has dreams, that means that God speaks to everyone. He speaks to believers and he speaks to non-believers in their dreams. And I know this can, you know, probably be a difficult thing for some people to recognize as well, because some people think that God does not speak to non-believers. But yes, God, he speaks to non-believers as well. So... Another thing is depending on how busy our mind is, we can dream about random things that we have done throughout the day or just random things that we have on our heart. And the scripture that I want to share with you guys concerning this is Ecclesiastes chapter 5 verses 3. So Ecclesiastes chapter 5 verses 3 says, for a dream comes with much business and a fool's voice with many words. So for a dream comes with much business and a fool's voice with many words. So for this portion, I just want to share two commentaries with you guys. And these commentaries are coming from theologians and Bible scholars and I definitely would recommend that you, when you are diving into the word, doing Bible study, or you're just studying the word, do not shy away from looking into, you know, theology and scholars when it comes to Christianity, because it really does give us a deeper understanding of the meaning behind what we have read. So I'm going to first give a commentary from Joseph Benson. And this commentary is relating to the scripture Ecclesiastes 5.3. So Joseph Benson was actually an English Methodist preacher and a biblical scholar who was best known for his extensive work as a commentator on the, a commentator on the Bible. 
So this was his commentary that he left concerning Ecclesiastes 5.3. So he says, when men's minds are distracted and oppressed with too much business in the day, they are frequently disturbed with confused and perplexed dreams in the night. And as such dreams proceed from and are the evidence of a hurry of business filling the head, so many and hasty words flow from and are a proof of folly reigning in the heart. So I know that Maybe the wording of this can be a bit confusing for you guys because Joseph Benson actually was born in 1749 and he passed in 1821. So basically he's saying when our minds are distracted and oppressed, we can definitely just have these random dreams. We can have these random thoughts in our minds when we go to sleep at night that don't really have much to do with the messaging of what God is trying to tell us. So it may not be something specific that God is telling us about our present or our future. And then I also want to give you guys the commentary that Matthew Poole had given. And he was a English nonconformist theo theologian and a biblical commentator. So he says, concerning the scripture, he says, when men's minds are distracted, and he basically says the same thing that um, Joseph Benson had said. So he says, when men's minds are distracted and oppressed with too much business in the day, they dream of it in the night. And I'm I'm pretty sure that we can definitely relate to this where we probably we're thinking about something and then we ended up dreaming about it, but it didn't have like a huge significant meaning. So he also goes into the portion where it says a fool's voice is known. It says it discovers the man to be foolish and rash and inconsiderate man by multitude of words. So again, we know that yes, God does speak to us in our dreams, but he also, sometimes we also have dreams based on the things that we were thinking about throughout the day. And this is also why we have to try to keep a sound spirit where our spirit is just not so all over the place, because then that can get in the way of truly hearing what God is telling us. And the things that we have going on could, you know, just cloud our judgment and everything. So. I want us to start with the first dream that was reported in the Bible, and that is in Genesis 20. But I want us to read Genesis 12 for context because it leads up to the dream that Abimelech had. And I think if I was to just go into Genesis 20 without giving the context of Genesis 12, it kind of would be a bit confusing. So let's read Genesis 12 for context. And these scriptures are, are going to exemplify how God uses our dreams to warn us. So in Genesis 12, it all started when God told Abraham to leave his hometown, which was Haran, with his possessions and some relatives. And when the Lord told Abraham to leave his home country, it was an auditory direction. So here in Genesis 12, it was just an auditory direction. It was not a dream. It did not specify that it was a dream. So um, Abraham was 75 years old at this time and God told him that he would bless him and his family. And then on the other side of that, God told him that he would curse those that curse him. So, you know, God, he truly is serious business about us as his children. And for Genesis 12, not much context is given, you know, as we will see Abraham and his wife journey throughout many places, but not, not much context is given about where he wanted Abraham to go during that time. <laughs> Sorry, I hope that wasn't loud. 
but God was introducing introducing him to the territory that he wanted to bless him in, that he already declared him blessed in. And he was basically making that a promise to him. So on their journey, him and his wife, so on their journey, Abraham told his wife, Sari, so is it Sari? Because I know they changed it to Sarah after, but S-A-R-A-I, Sari. Sarai. Okay. Sarai. Sarai. Okay. So, okay. So he, he basically told his wife that she needs to lie to the people. So he told, he told her that she needed to lie because she was beautiful. And this honestly shows that beauty is an asset and a gift from God as well. He was, he was scared. He was scared that she would, if he told them that she was his wife, that they would kill him, that they would hate him and grow jealous of him because he had a beautiful wife. And she actually agreed to this. So there was a famine in Egypt at this time as well. So let's just start reading it. This is going to be the first time that Abraham had his wife lie about being his sister. So this is Genesis 12 verses 1. And we're only going to read up until verses 17. So the call of Abram. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. So this is what I mean about it just being an auditory thing and not a dream. So the Lord told him to go from his country and he will show him the land that he wants him to go to. And it says, and I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him and Lot went with him. And I believe Lot was his nephew. I think it, it says that later on. So it says, so Abraham went as the Lord had told him and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haran and Abraham took Sar Sari. Oh my goodness. Uh, okay. He took his wife and Lot and his brother's sons and all their possessions that they had gathered and the people that they had acquired in Haran, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land of the place of Shechem to the Oak of Mor. At the time the Canaanites were in the land, then the Lord appeared to Abram, Abram and said, to your offspring. So it's saying that the it's it's saying that the Lord appeared to him. So again, this is not a dream, but this is just an appearance. And when it comes to appearance, this is this is I don't want to go too far off, but this could definitely be another Bible study that we do when it says that God appeared to somebody. But it says, then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built there an altar of the, he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there, he moved to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on it, still going towards Negev. So now it's going to talk about Abram and his wife in Egypt. So now there was a famine in the land. So Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there. For the famine there was severe in the land. When he was about to enter Egypt, he said to Sari, his wife, I know that you are a woman, beautiful in appearance. And when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me. So he had this fear. Nope. 
he had this fear that she was beautiful and he he was just like you need to tell them that you are not my wife so it says i know that you are a a woman beautiful in appearance and when the egyptians see you they will say this is his wife then they will kill me but they will let you live say you are my sister that i may go so that it may go well with me because of you and that my life will be spared for your sake when abram entered egypt the egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful so he was right in that aspect so and when the princes of pharaoh saw her they praised her to pharaoh and the woman was taken into pharaoh's house and for her sake he dealt with abram He's just like, I'm just going to keep him here because you say this is your brother. So I'll just keep him around. And he had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male servants, female servants, female donkeys, and camels. But the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his health with great plagues because of Sari, Abram's wife. So Pharaoh called Abram and said, what is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister so that I took her for my wife? Now then, here is your wife, take her and go. And Pharaoh gave men orders concerning him and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. So truly, this is just side commentary. It was not necessary for Abram to lie that she was his wife it was not necessary and it it caused damage it caused harm but it also kind of shows us the importance of a covenant to god as well because even though abram had his wife lie god he was still putting affliction on the house of pharaoh because he was basically getting in the way of the covenant between abram and his wife so now let's go into the second time that Abraham had his wife lie about being his sister because this is when the interaction between Abimelech and the Lord had occurred and this is where the context of the dream comes into play. So this is going to be in Genesis verses 20. No, Genesis Genesis chapter 20 verses 1 through 2. So Abraham and Abimelech from there, Abram journeyed towards the territory of the Negev and lived between Kadesh and Shur. And he sojourned in Ger Gerar, Gerar and Abraham and Sarah, his wife. She is my sister. So it just says, and Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. So again, he he's taking Sarah. So first it was Pharaoh and now it's Abimelech. So these are both kings, let's remember. So the kings, they wanted Abraham's wife. So it goes on to say, but God came to Abimelech in a dream by the night and said to him, behold, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is a man's wife. So the Lord is basically saying, you're messing with the covenant that they have. So it goes on to say, now Abimelech had not approached her. So he did not approach her about it just yet. So he said, Lord, will you kill an innocent people? Did he not himself say to me, she is my sister? And she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of the heart and the innocence of my hands, I have done this. So he, he basically is right because now he's getting in trouble because of what Abraham and his wife, Sarah, has said. But he's still, he's still you know, being warned by the Lord about this in his dream. Then God said to him in the dream, yes, I know that you have done this in the integrity of your heart and it was I who kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. 
Now then return the man's wife, for he is a prophet, so that he will pray for you, and you shall live. But if you do not return her, know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours. So here is what you will notice about this dream that Abimelech had. God is giving him a choice. He is giving him two options. He's saying, "Give return her or you will die or wait the okay hold on let me let me not confuse you guys so the the two options are he could either go against god by keeping her or he could return her back and he will not die so what can we learn from this god used abamelech's dream to send him a warning so this is just an example of how god uses our dreams to send us warnings and through this dream, we can see that he had the ability to either accept or deny the choices that he was given. So Abimelech was also able to interact with God in this dream with the responses that he was giving him. Because as you could see, they were having a dialogue. They were able to speak to each other. So we also learned that Abimelech had to choose which action he was going to take based on the messages that God gave him. You know, he could have still kept Sarah, but he would have died. He could have been disobedient and still chose, like he could have said like, oh, she's a beautiful woman and I want to have her. But he believed in God, so he did not ignore what he was shown. The next thing, God can speak to us in our dreams if we are sinning against him, even unknowingly. So as we'll see, Abimelech, he, he really was not, when you really think about it, he was not guilty for what he did because he did not have the knowledge that she was Abraham's wife. Because even Abraham was confirming to him that that was his sister. So to his knowledge, he was not actually sinning, but through what God had revealed to him, he was warning him before he actually ended up in that position. So the Lord had to intervene because of the lie that Abraham told. So this, this is honestly something to think about as well. There are many different scenarios and things that happen in life all the time where we may think that we are doing something genuinely in our hearts, but there is deceit behind it so abraham was struggling to really trust god because god never instructed abraham to lie and tell those people that sarah was his sister even though you know it was revealed later on that in verse 12 that um she was actually his stepsister through his father so technically they were brothers and sisters, but not really at the same time because they had already made a marriage covenant. So the next thing we are going to be talking about is covenants. Covenants can be made in our dreams. Yes, covenants. So let's define what a covenant is before we even dive into this whole thing. A covenant is a pact, a treaty, a, an alliance, or an agreement between two parties of equal or unequal authority. So let's look at the dream covenant that happened between God and Abraham. And we're going to be going into Genesis 15. So through this dream covenant, God had given Abraham a future projection so through this, we will be able to see how God gives us a future projection of what is to come. He promised Abraham that he and his offspring will be blessed. So he was blessing Abraham through the covenant that was being made in the dream. But something to also note here is that it was beyond the years that Abraham would even be here on the earth. And this can also be a revelation for someone as well to help you understand what it truly means to be blessed by God, what, what God does when he blesses people, because some people think that blessings are just an immediate thing that come. 
blessings are just not always immediate things that come. This is also why we have to remember that the things that we are going through today, it is beyond us ourselves. It is so much deeper than that. It is truly also for our future generations, the generations to come after us. That's why when you're going through hardships in your life and you're just thinking, why me? Why me? You don't even realize that you're the very person in your bloodline that God is birthing this huge generational blessing in. And a lot of times it's so easy for us to want quick blessings, but these quick blessings that we receive, they may not be as long lasting as when God is ready to bless your future generations through you. So let's just read Genesis 15 and let's read from verses 12 through 16. So it says, as the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abraham and behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abraham, and isn't this an interesting thing? When you look at the wording here, it says, and behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. But as you continue reading, it is not going to be a bad thing that's revealed to Abraham. So it says, then the Lord said to Abraham, know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in the land that is not theirs and will be servants there. And they will be afflicted for 400 years. And yes, he, he's talking about affliction, but it, it doesn't end just like that. He's saying, but I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve. And afterwards, they shall come out with great possessions. So after the suffering, they will come out with great possessions and God, he will bring judgment. As for you, you shall go to your father's in peace you shall be buried in a good old age and they shall come back here in the fourth generation for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete so this is just an example right here how God made a covenant with Abraham and basically declared him blessed and his future generations blessed through the dream that he had and as you can see, he's not giving Abraham options here. He's just telling him, he's giving him a rundown of what was happening and what was to come. So the next thing I want to talk about is Joseph and Joseph's dream about ruling over his family. And these scriptures are going to be examples of how God uses symbols to speak to us in our dreams. So this is an, another example of how God speaks to us. And the scriptures that we will read are about two dreams. So we're going to be talking about two dreams that Joseph had about ruling over his family. So Abraham, who we just read about, he had a son named Isaac and Isaac had a son called Jacob, who then had a son called Joseph. So Joseph, he had dream, he had these dreams at just 17 years old, and God was revealing to him that he would rule over his family. But Joseph, he didn't understand it at the time. But even though he didn't understand it at the time, that did not stop what God was doing. But let's also recognize here as we read it we will see that even though Joseph didn't understand the dream his father did and his brothers understood the dream and this is something that we need to be careful about too be careful who you share your dreams with okay just because they're family they're friends definitely go to a trusted person when you are sharing your dreams because the revelations that God gives us through our dreams, they are so powerful and they're not always to be shared with just anybody. So Joseph, he had a lot of brothers and they were jealous of him. I'm pretty sure you guys know the story of Joseph. 
They were jealous of him and they hated him because he was the youngest and he was favored by their father, Jacob. So let's read it. We're just going to read from verses. We'll start from verse one and go to verse 11, because I think that does a good job with giving the context. Okay, so this is going to be Genesis 37 verses one. So it says, Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings, in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bahal and Zephal and Zepha, Zelpha. These names are hard. His, his father's wives, so Bilha and Zelpha were his father's wives, and Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph. So when it says, now Israel loved Joseph, they're talking about his father, Jacob, because Jacob was also called Israel. So Israel loved Joseph more than any other any other of his sons because he was the son of his old age and he made him a robe with many colors but when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him so <laughs> no that's so funny um but it's okay let's say it says and he made he made him a robe but his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers and they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him so they already had this animosity towards their younger brother now joseph had a dream so this is going to be the part where it talks about the dream now joseph had a dream and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. This is why I say we have to be careful who we share our dreams with. So they hated him even more after he shared the dream. So he said to them, hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding shoves in the field and behold, my shove arose and stood upright and behold, your shoves gathered around it and bowed down to my shove. His brothers said to him, are you indeed to reign over us or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed another dream. So this is the second dream that he's telling them. Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers. So let's pause for a second here because Joseph, he was young, right? So he kind of was naive. Like his brothers, they already hated him and they already spoke against the first dream that he told them about. And now he's still going to them to tell them about the other dream. So it says, then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his, to his father and his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, what is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come and bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. So his father was just like, this is an interesting thing that Joseph is telling us about. So he kept it in the back of his mind. But you will see, like, his father rebuked him. And even though his father had rebuked him, that did not stop what God had already planned. So even if you have opposition towards your dreams, you see that the Lord is exposing something good to you that he wants to do. Do not put, do not allow fear to overcome you to a point where you're just like, wow, the devil, he's going to come in and he's going to steal what God has for me because the power of God is so much greater than that. 
And let's let's look at the symbols that the Lord gave to Joseph. So he gave Joseph the Shevs in the first dream, right? And then in the second dream, he gave him the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars as symbolism. So a chef, just to let you guys know, if you don't know, like the chefs, it basically was a harvest. And we know a harvest is a good thing. This is what you are looking for. It's a quality of stocks of wheat, rye, oats, or barley bound together in a bundle of stocks or straw. And as we can learn earlier in the scriptures in Genesis 42, the jealousy, you know, the jealousy that his brothers had towards him and the dream did not stop it from manifesting in his life because God, he still blessed Joseph so greatly and his brothers actually had to come to Joseph for help and they they had to bow down to him indeed because he was basically the ruler. If you guys want to read into that, it's in Genesis 42. So when we compare this to other dreams that we just talked about like the dream that God gave Abimelech, you know, he was giving Abimelech a warning. And with that warning, it came a choice that had to be made. But with Joseph, he just spoke to Joseph with symbols. And it was basically plain, even though it was symbols, it was still plain and matter of fact, because this is what God had already determined for him. So it wasn't like he was telling Joseph, this is what I am I want you to do. He wasn't giving him like specific instructions. So, um, you know, with this, Joseph, he didn't really have options. So the power of God was going to work regardless. And the symbols that he showed Joseph to were symbols that he was familiar with. When we think about this, let's just think of ourselves. Most of the time, God is not going to show us a chef. You know, he's not going to show us things that we're not familiar with to communicate with us. Because when God is communicating with us, he truly wants us to actually understand him and what he is telling us. You know, God, he's not wanting us to be in a place of confusion. He doesn't want us to question, you know, what he wants for us in our life. He wants us to be able to understand these things, even though these things, again, they definitely can still be confusing. And chefs, they were definitely really common back then for them to use all the time. He, well, maybe if you, you know, live like that off-grid life and you farm a lot, maybe it's something that you deal with a lot too. But here, when you're living in the city and stuff like that, we don't use things like that. So just keep that in mind as well. The symbols that God is using in your dreams are going to be symbols that you can also relate to. And I think, again, if Joseph was a little more wise and a little more self-aware, he probably would have just kept his dreams to himself because his brothers were so jealous of him. And even though when you read the rest of the chapter, you will see how his brothers, you know, were always trying to sabotage him. That did not stop what God had already planned for him. So even, even with the naive attitude that, you know, Joseph had, God allowed the dream to come to pass regardless, even with all of the challenges that happened afterwards. So let's take a second right now to reflect on our own dreams. Hold on, I'm thirsty. <laughs> let's take a second right now to reflect on our own dreams. So has when when you're having a dream, does the Lord speak to you in symbols? Does he speak to you in a way that is matter of fact, where it's just very plain and simple and easy for you to understand? Or is it, do you find yourself trying to figure out how to decipher what it is that the Lord is showing you? Another thing that we should, you know, ask ourselves and think about, 
you know, you may not always understand your dreams now and the symbols that God is showing to you now, but the grace and the glory of God will always be revealed and manifested in due time. So like I was saying earlier, even if you do not fully understand the meaning of what you are seeing in your dreams right now, God can definitely reveal it to you later on. And let's also remember Joseph, he is a descendant of Abraham, right? And God made the promise to Abraham that his people will be blessed. So part of the dream that Joseph had was a manifestation of what God had already declared and spoken to Abraham and in his dream about how he was going to declare all of his people blessed and the generations after him. So let's also stop and ask ourselves, what does it truly mean to be blessed by God? What do you consider to be blessed by God? Would you still recognize yourself to be blessed even through tough circumstances that you are facing in your life? Or will you no longer consider yourself to be a blessed child of God? Because if you know the story of Joseph, you will know that his brothers sold him into slavery and that transformed his life completely. And he did endure a lot of suffering, but even through that suffering, the Lord allowed Joseph to be blessed and he was favored everywhere that he went. So what does it mean to you? to be blessed by God? Does that mean that you never will suffer any affliction or any pain or have any heartache? Or will you recognize that even through all of that, you are still blessed by God? And another question to ask yourself, do you trust God to bring these things to pass? Whatever it is that God is showing you, do you trust him to bring these things to pass regardless of the opposition that is coming your way? Or do you allow fear to get in the way? Do you allow the, the thoughts and the wishes of others around you that may be jealous and envious and may have a hateful spirit, will you allow what they are projecting at you to be what you stand firm on? Because I know that when, when God shows us the good and the blessings that he wants to bring into our life, most of the time he's also going to show us on what's on the other side of that. He's going to show us what the enemy is trying to bring to come against us to stop what God is doing. But are you going to still believe in God or are you going to brush off what God has shown you? And you're going to basically say the power of the kingdom of darkness is greater than the power of God. And then another question that we should be asking, how was, how was Joseph supposed to understand the meaning behind the symbols, you know, behind the sun, the moon, and the stars? He didn't understand it, but his father understood it. And regardless of him not understanding it, God, he still made it happen. And in the scriptures, it never went into detail either about how his father knew the meaning of the dream. But regardless, the meaning of the dream was revealed to Joseph in the end. So that's just, you know, some things for us to think about as we are having our own dreams and we are facing different things in our life. When we when we are seeing these things that are opposing us, because Joseph, he had these dreams about being blessed, but at the same time, like he was in a, a really dark place and he experienced a lot of hardships. But he still was able to overcome all of that. So the next one that I want us to go into is when the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream. So the Lord, when he appeared to Solomon in this dream, he appeared because he wanted to bless him. So if you guys don't remember Solomon, he was the king of Israel and he married Pharaoh's daughter. And as we, I think I did mention it, Pharaoh was the king of Egypt. So this is basically the connection. And he built the first temple in Jerusalem. And he was also the father, his father was um, King David. 
So this is just a little background of Solomon. He was the king of Israel. He married Pharaoh's daughter. He built the temple in Jerusalem and his father was King David. So this, this dream that he had was shown in 1 Kings chapter 3. So let's read 1 Kings chapter 3 verses 5. So it says, at Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by the night, and God said, ask what I shall give you. So here in the dream, God is giving Solomon the ability to ask for what he wants from the Lord. And the Lord basically did this because he had already planned on blessing him. And Solomon said, you have shown me great and steadfast love. You have, you have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, David, my father, because he walked before you in faithfulness and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart towards you. And you have kept him for his great and steadfast love and have given him a son to sit on, on his throne this day. And now, O oh Lord, my God, you have made your servant king in place of David. So he's talking about himself. He's basically saying that he is now king in place of his father. In place of David, my father, although I am but a little child, I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too many to be numbered. So he's basically acknowledging like, Lord, you have put me in charge of all of these people. And he, he basically is showing as well that he has a great heart because he is wanting to see how he can be a good steward of these people. We know that when God puts us in a position of power where we are able to influence people, that's not something that you take lightly. So he's saying, give your... Okay, so it says, and your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too many to be numbered or counted for multitude. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people that I may discern between good and evil for you, for who is able to govern this, your great people. So he is asking the Lord right now for wisdom. He says, give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to govern this is this your great people. So, you know, he already has this position. He, he basically already has this position of power and he could be asking for even more, you know, he could be asking for even more great things from the Lord, but he decided to ask the Lord for wisdom in this. So it pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this and God said to him, because you have asked this and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right. Behold, I now do according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind so that none like you has been before you and none like you shall rise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that no other king shall compare with you all your days. And if you will walk in my ways, keep my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. And Solomon awoke and behold, it was a dream. Then he came to Jerusalem and stood before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and offered up burnt offerings and peace offerings and made a feast for all his servants. So I think this is just pretty clear right here. And we know that Solomon, he, he was basically known to be the wisest person 
the wisest person to ever exist after this. So the Lord definitely kept his promise on that. Um, hold on, I just have to fix this right here. Okay, yeah, so he basically asked for wisdom and the Lord gave it to him, but he also blessed him beyond what he asked for. And this interaction right here, I think is really interesting for us to think about. Have you ever had an interaction like this where the Lord is asking you, what I sh what shall I give you? And when it comes to interactions with the Lord in our dreams, I think that it can come in many different ways because I'm going to use a dream that I've had as an example. So when God had first revealed to me that he wanted me to have a ministry and I had already started it at that point, but I was still new in it. You know, I still consider myself to be new in the min in ministry. But I remember being surrounded by other, other people of God. So we were sitting at this table, right? And it was almost like we were in a class, like we were having a session. We were having a learning session. And the it was the Lord, he was literally there in that dream. So when it when it says that at Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by the night, sometimes we think that, we're going to have these dreams and we're going to see the physical body of God when we see him in our dreams. But something specific that I remember the Lord saying to us at that table is that we need to be careful how we are speaking his word and what we are telling his people. And if, you know, he was saying like, we will be punished if we willingly tell his people the wrong thing or make his people go astray. So when God is placing you in a position of influence or power over his people, he He he's not just gonna leave you without any guidance. He's going to come to you and he's going to speak to you in ways that you will be able to understand. And I think that when people are reading this scripture where, where they're saying at Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream, they may think that the Lord appeared to him in this physical form where you could see his face, you could see his hands and his body, but it was not like that at all when I had that interaction in my dream. And again, there were other there were other believers around me, other believers that had that God was building up in ministry as well. So let's truly ask ourselves. Can we recognize when the spirit of God is speaking to us in our dreams or if it's something else? Can we recognize when the spirit of God is directly in our dreams speaking to us? This is definitely something really important. I think when it's happening, it it is made clear. But when describing it, it just sounds confusing. I don't know if you guys understand that, but or I'm pretty sure you guys do understand where I'm coming from with that. But it's truly about understanding what the Lord is doing. So let's talk about the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. And this is where Daniel interprets the dream for Nebuchadnezzar. So we're going to be reading in the book of Daniel. Yeah, it is very hard to describe. And I think that the whole basis and foundation of our belief in God and Christianity is our faith, which faith alone is something that cannot be easily described. There are many different things uh, that we go through in life that it, it just appears to be mysterious, but it still has its truth behind it, you know? But let's let's read the story of Nebuchadnezzar where he had a dream and he basically had Daniel interpret the dream. And, you know, these next subjects will reveal that dreams which God gives us can, in fact, trouble us in our spirit. So he, God, he blessed Daniel with the gift of dream interpretation. And we're going to read into that. 
So he blessed him with the gift of dream interpretation, just like he did with Joseph. And, you know, Joseph and Daniel both interpreted dreams for kings. So I want us to read Daniel chapter one, verses 17. So it says, as for these four youths, so as for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. So it's saying all visions and dreams. So God gave Daniel an understanding in all visions and dreams. So this means that Daniel had the ability to interpret visions and dreams. And just to give context on the scripture, since we just read the first line of it, I mean, verse 17. So this was Daniel chapter one, verse 17. So we're just reading a little part, but I want to give you guys the context. So this is when Daniel was taken to Babylon. So Daniel was taken to Babylon where Nebuchadnezzar was king at that time. And he was coming from Judah where Joachim was the king at that time. And when it says, as for these four youths, they're talking about four people of God, young people of God. So God equipped four young people of God that are called youths with wisdom. And they were of royal family and nobility without blemish. And they had good appearance for Nebuchadnezzar's standards. And this is what Nebuchadnezzar was asking for. So they were educated for three years before they stood before the king, Nebuchadnezzar. And the four youths, they were chosen as competent enough to stand before the king in the palace. So Nebuchadnezzar, he was asking for this, and that is why they brought them there from Judah. And Nebuchadnezzar, he wanted them to learn the language and the literature of the Chaldeans, which were the people of Babylonia at that time. So the four youths were actually four males, and they were actually renamed by the chief Enoch that was in charge of them at that time. So I'm pretty sure you guys have heard of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So Hananiah was renamed Shadrach, um, Michelle was renamed Meshach, and Azar Az Azariah was named Abednego. So Daniel, he was renamed Balthazar. So God, he gave Daniel all understanding in visions and dreams. And this is important because without understanding this context, there could really be, you know, no understanding of what I'm going to be showing you guys later on. Um, this context is also important because it gives us a background of how things really started before Daniel began giving King Nebuchadnezzar dream interpretations. So the first dream that Nebuchadnezzar had, so let's just start with this. When Nebuchadnezzar had his dream, right? He commanded all of the magicians, all of the enchanters, all of the sorcerers to come and interpret his dream for him. So he felt like this was an important dream. So that's why he was calling on all of these magicians, enchanters, and sorcerers. And this is why I say again, having the spirit of God is so important when it comes to interpreting your dreams. Because none of the magicians, none of the enchanters or the sorcerers were able to interpret the dream for him. Because none of them had a true connection with the spirit of God, so they couldn't do it. And let's remember... In, in Genesis 40, verses 8, what was revealed, this is what was revealed to Joseph. It says, they said to him, we have had dreams and there is no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Please let them tell me. Please tell them to me. And this is what I had mentioned before. Joseph basically revealed in this passage of scripture that interpretations belong to God because God is the one that gives us the dreams. So of course, God is going to be the one to interpret it for us. So Nebuchadnezzar, he actually was so angry. 
He was so angry that nobody could interpret the dream for him that he actually commanded that all the wise men were to be destroyed. So, you know, this again shows the almost the desperation that Nebuchadnezzar had for figuring out what was happening in this dream. And he was so angry that nobody could give him the interpretation that he was needing that he was just like, just destroy all the wise men. But let's also remember going back to the four youths, they were considered wise men, okay? So this is where Daniel now had to pray to God to give him the ability to interpret the dream because he's he's part of the four youths. So when they went out to seek Daniel, he's like, no, like I could interpret this dream. We don't have to go that far. You know, and this was really dramatic of Nebuchadnezzar, but again, it shows how desperate he was to actually have the deeper meaning and understanding of what the dream meant. So it's going to be in Daniel chapter two. And we're going to read Daniel chapter two, verses one through three. So in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His spirit was troubled. So again, it's saying that his spirit was troubled because what he had seen is in his dream and his deep sleep left him. Then the king commanded that the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans be summoned to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king and the king said to them, I had a dream and my spirit is troubled to know the dream. So he's desperate. Then the Chaldeans said to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servant the dream and we will show you the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, the word, the word from me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn limb from limb and your houses shall be laid in ruins. But if you show the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. So therefore, show me the dream and its interpretation. They answered a second time and said, let the king tell his servants the dream and we will and we will show its interpretations. And the king answered and said, I know with certainty that you are trying to gain time because you see that the word from me is firm. So he's basically saying like, I am onto you guys. Like you guys do not know what you're doing. You're just trying to waste time because you know that if you do not give me the right interpretation, you will be destroyed. So verse nine says, if you do not make the dream known to me, there is but one sentence for you. You have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the times change. Therefore, tell me the dream and I shall know that you can show me its interpretation. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, there is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand. <laughs> so now it's like they're losing confidence. At first, they started out strong. They felt like they were able to do it. But now there's like, there is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand. For no great and powerful king has asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or Chaldean. The thing that the king acts is difficult and no one can show it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh so you know right here is showing that they do not even believe in god so they do not have the spirit of god to interpret it so verse 12 says because of this the king was angry and very furious and commanded that all the wise men of babylon be destroyed so the decree went out and the wise men were about to be killed and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. So again, Daniel was considered to be wise in that town. So then Daniel replied with prudence and discretion to Arich, 
Arroch, Arroch, Ariach, Ariach. Okay, I'm sorry, I can't say that name. Uh, so he went to him, the captain. So this is the captain of the king's guard who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He had declared to him, the cap, the king's captain, why is the decree of the king so urgent? Then he said to them he, that Daniel would basically make the matter known. And Daniel went up and requested the king to appoint him in time, at a time, that he might show the interpretation to the king. So Daniel, he went to seek mercy and wisdom from God because, you know, he did not want to die. He heard what Nebuchadnezzar had said. And let's remember that Daniel was considered one of the wise men during this time. So they would have killed him if he did not know the interpretation. So now in verse 17, this is where God reveals Nebuchadnezzar's dream to Daniel. So it says, then Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Hananiah. So Okay, then Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Hananiah, Michelle, and Azariah, his companions. So he he basically went to the other four the other three youths that were went with him into Babylon and told them to seek mercy from God of heaven concerning this mystery so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon then the mystery was received no then the mystery was revealed to Daniel so it was then revealed to Daniel in the vision of the night. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. So look right here. This is an important point to highlight. So it says, then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in the vision of the night. So when you're reading the scripture and it says in the vision of the night, that could also mean like a physical vision where you are awake. So God had revealed it to him. He didn't have to be with, you know, King Nebuchadnezzar at the time. And it doesn't even specify that he heard what the dream was about just yet at that time. So then Daniel answered, this is verse 20. Daniel answered and said, blessed be the name of God forever and ever to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells in him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise for you have given me wisdom and might. And I have now made known and and now have made known to me what I asked of you, for you have made known to us the king's matter. So now he is excited because he knows that they're not going to be put to death or anything like that. He he was confident that the Lord would answer anyways. So therefore, Daniel went into Arch. So this is the captain of the king. I'm just going to say the captain of the king because I'm butchering that name. So the captain of the king, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon, he went and said thus to him, do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king and I will show the king the interpretation. Then the captain of the king brought in Daniel before the king in haste and said thus to him i have found among the exiles from judah a man who will make known to the king the interpretation the king declared to daniel whose name was Belt beltazar so let's remember they're they're addressing them and daniel by the name that he was renamed with so that's why they say beltazar are you able to make known to me the dream that I have seen and its interpretation, 
Daniel answered the king and said, No wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show to the king the mystery that the king has asked, but there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar, who will be in the latter days. So now he's going to go into what the dream meant. He says, your dream and the visions of your head as you lay in bed are these. To you, O king, as you lay in bed, came thoughts of what would be after this. And he who reveals mysteries made known to you what is to be. So he's basically telling the king that, you know, these, these thoughts that he had and that he's seen came from the spirit of God because God wanted to show Nebuchadnezzar as king what was to come. But as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because of any wisdom that I have more than any that more than all the living, but in order that the interpretation might be made known to the king, that you may know the thoughts of your mind. Okay, no problem. God bless you. So this is where we will hear the interpretation. This is verse 31. So it says, you saw, O king, and behold, a great image, this image, mighty and of exceeding brightness. So when you are listening to Daniel and how he's describing the dream, you will hear him say things like image and thoughts. And this is what we went over in the beginning when we were defining what it means to dream. So we're having these images and these thoughts in our mind. So you saw, O king, and behold, a great image, this image mighty of exceeding brightness stood before you and its appearance so frightening. Mesa, come here. Hold on, let me. Okay, so you saw, O king, and behold, a great image, this image mighty and exceeding and of exceeding brightness stood before you and its appearance was frightening. The head of the image was of fine gold. So now we we're seeing that, you know, he what God showed him was it's OK. It's OK. What God showed him was symbols. So the head of this image was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its middle and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. As you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hands and it struck the image on the feet of the iron and the clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze of silver, and the gold all together were broken in pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them would be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So now he's going to tell the king what the dream meant. So this was the dream. Now we will tell the king its interpretation. You, O king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, and the might, and the glory. So this is basically Daniel now giving King Nebuchadnezzar almost like an image of who he is and what God has allowed him to accomplish. And this is important to paint out because when God gives you a position of power and authority, there are rules and responsibilities that come with that. So it says, and into whose hands he has given, wherever they dwell, the children of man, the beast of the field and the birds of heaven, making you rule over them all. You are the head of gold, so remember, it said it had said there was a head of gold. So he's saying, you are the head of gold. 
Hold on, I, I moved this, so now I lost my place. Hold on. Did I go that far? Wait, hold on, hold on. I shouldn't have moved my mouse. Okay, so this was the dream. Now we will tell the king its interpretation. You, O king, the king of kings, whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power and the might and the glory, and into whose hand he has given wherever they dwell, the children of men, the beasts of the field and the birds of the heavens, making you rule over them all. You are the head of gold. Another kingdom inferior to you shall arise after you. Yet a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And there shall be a fourth kingdom strong as iron, because iron breaks to pieces and shatters all things. And like iron that crushes, it shall break and crush all these. And as you saw the feet and the toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it shall be divided kingdom, but some of the firmness of iron shall be in it, just as you saw iron mixed with the soft clay, and as the toes of the feet are partly iron and partly clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. As you saw the iron mixed with soft clay, so they will mix with one another in marriage, but they will not hold together, just as iron does not mix with clay. And in these days, in those days of the king, God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left with another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and break and bring them to the end, and it shall stand forever. Just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the, and the gold, a great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain and its interpretation sure. So as we can see, that was a lot, right? Daniel, he was able to give the interpretation based on the symbols that were given in the dream. And he even mentioned, you know, things that had to do specifically with Nebuchadnezzar. And this is why it's important as well when you have dreams like this and you're not sure of the interpretation, don't just go online Googling the meaning of specific things because God, he gives us dreams specifically tailored to us. So we need to have the spirit of God or go to someone that has the spirit of God and the gift of interpretation to do this for us. And later on in the chapter, after Daniel gave the interpretation of the dream to King Nebuchadnezzar, he ended up being promoted. And that's what Nebuchadnezzar had said in the beginning. He had said that he basically was going to promote whoever gave him the correct interpretation of the dream. So in chapter four of Daniel, he goes on to interpret a second dream for Nebuchadnezzar. But I recommend that you guys read and study that on your own because that would just make this a lot longer than, you know, we already have been here. I know it's been like over an hour now, almost two hours. So thank you guys for listening. I really hope that God is giving you guys revelation that you are needing in your minds and in your spirit, in your hearts, and that he will continue to reveal more things to you as you are on this journey in learning, you know, because we are constantly learning. We do not know everything on our own. And as a body, as we stand together, we are able to help each other. So I want us to talk about false dreams, okay? False dreams. I know that this is definitely going in a different direction, but false dreams is such a huge thing. And when it comes to false dreams, manipulation is at play 100%. This is truly a form of deception that is used to gain control over others. 
And when you come into agreement with something that never was declared over your life by the Spirit of God, it can in fact happen if you allow it to, you know, be something that you come into agreement with. This is why even when it comes to receiving words from people, instead of immediately receiving it, you have to ask the Spirit of God if that is something that he has in store for your life. Ask him to reveal truths to you so that you do not just hold on to something that God did not speak. So from what we have gathered so far, I know that we went over a lot, but from what we have gathered so far, I really hope that you guys can see the power that is truly in prophetic dreams and the domino effect that comes after it. Action is really required when it comes to these prophetic dreams that we have. So let's dive into some scriptures that talks about false dreams. So I want us to go into Ezekiel. So Ezekiel, he was giving a word of warning to those who were giving false dreams, like sharing false dreams with others. So this is going to be in, let me see, this is, let me make this bigger actually, because my eyes. So this is going to be in Ezekiel chapter 13, verses seven through nine. So it says, did you not see a false dream and tell a lie using your secret ways when you said, this is what the Lord says when I have not spoken. So the Lord God says, because you have spoken false words and seen a lie, I am against you, says the Lord, says the Lord God. My hand will be against those who see false dreams and speak false words. They will have no more place in the gathering of my wise people. Their names will not be written down with the people of Israel. And we know the people of Israel are the people of God that God has declared blessed. They will not go into the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord God. So Zachar so um basically what he was saying here is that you should not be using false dreams to manipulate people into believing something that you want them to believe because we know that this is something that happens even when it comes to prophets giving false prophetic words there are dreamers that have dreams where god he definitely is giving you a message for someone but if you then come in and try to twist what god is showing you and lying about it that's definitely not something that god is going to allow so Let's go to Zechariah because this is going to be where Zechariah talks about how people are lacking a shepherd and how the people were afflicted because they lacked a shepherd. And I want us to go over this more as well because we know that Jesus is the good shepherd. So for those who do not have that connection with God, with the spirit of God or with Jesus, they are going to allow themselves to be afflicted and they're going to allow deception to basically take over. So this is going to be Zechariah 10 2. For the household gods utter nonsense and the diviners see lies. They tell false dreams and give empty consolations. Therefore, the people wander like sheep. They are afflicted for lack of a shepherd. And they talk about, well, Jesus, he talks about being the shepherd, the good shepherd in John 10. And let's remember that the spirit of God is the key factor here. He is the key factor of dream interpretations. Without the spirit of God, we can be easily deceived. And then in verse three of Zechariah 10, it says, my, you know, God, he is in anger and he is expressing that anger of how people are using false dreams and false visions to manipulate and deceive the people. So it says, my anger is hot against the shepherds and I will punish the leaders for the Lord of hosts cares for his flock, the house of Judah. 
and will make them like this majestic seed in battle. So let's let's read part of John 10 where Jesus is saying, I am the good shepherd, because we will see that it's mentioned twice how they are lacking a shepherd, and that is why they are being deceived. So this is just another point that if you do not have the Spirit of God, you will easily be deceived by the words that people are using, the false visions and the false dreams that they are sharing. So it says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. So they are a thief and a robber because they're basically trying to hijack and take the spirit that belongs to God. You know, they are a thief and a robber because they are trying to take the flock that belongs to God. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper opens it. The sheep hears his voice. And when he calls his own sheep by name and leads them, when he has brought them out, all his own, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. So when you know the voice of God, when you know that Jesus is giving you a revelation, then you will not easily fall into the deception. And that means that you do not have a lack of a shepherd because you have already accepted Jesus. So this is definitely an important thing we need to remember we may we may really want to have an understanding of our dreams but do not seek out different sources if they do not have the spirit of god with them then do not seek them out to receive a revelation because they're not going to give you the correct revelation and then in jeremiah 23 it's speaking against lying prophets who lie about their dreams so Jeremiah 23, 25 says, and I have heard what the prophets have said who prophesy lies in my name saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. So, you know, this is something we have to watch out for. And just think about your own life, you know. I know that I have experienced a lot when it comes to going to spiritual leaders that I felt I could trust when I was just so young in the faith and could not really, you know, understand that you can't go to everybody. Not everyone has the spirit of God. There are people that are lying and deceiving you. So have you ever received a false word from someone who claimed that they had a prophetic dream? from God, and they wanted you to follow along with what they were saying. So in these instances, we have to remember, we don't have to automatically receive what the word that they have given us. We do not have to automatically receive that. We can just, you know, we could even say to them, like, I do not accept that, or I'm going to have to pray about that before you even receive it. So let me see. I want us I want us to go over how angels can help us in our dreams and then let's see because I know that this is really long but I I really hope that you guys are you know sticking with me it's not going to be much longer probably like 30 more minutes <laughs> that's long right but this is really a really good revelation that God gave me. And I really want you guys to have this understanding as well. So the next thing is that God, he can send angels to help us in our dreams. So I'm going to share two examples about how Joseph, Jesus's earthly father, had these dreams where they were basically like messages of confirmation, but also he was receiving like impartation from the Lord as well. So the scriptures before this were describing. So before we even read, I'm just going to give a background. So the scriptures before that were describing the birth of Jesus. So Joseph and Mary, they were engaged, right? 
when she was then she was pregnant with Jesus so they they didn't even have intercourse yet but she was pregnant from the spirit of God and Joseph he began to feel suspicious about this and I mean rightfully so because he didn't understand that they were actually chosen just yet and he was even contemplating divorcing her but he wanted to do it in a polite way because he didn't want to put her to shame because he's just like, how are you pregnant? But we have not even had intercourse yet. But this is when the angel came to Joseph in his dream and he confirmed to him that, yes, she is pregnant, but it's not because she cheated on you or anything, but it was because this was to fulfill what God had said from the beginning about a virgin conceiving and calling him Emmanuel. So after that, Joseph, he listened and did as the angel had commanded him. But I think, you know, it was right for him to have that feeling of question where he was just like, how is she pregnant when we haven't even done anything yet? So this is going to be in Matthew, Matthew chapter one, verses 20. It says, but as he considered these things, and when it says, but as he considered these things, it's talking about how he was considering divorcing her. Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. So, so when the two wise men heard and this is more more backstory. When the two wise men heard of Jesus' birth, they came to the east of Bethlehem and they were seeking him out. They wanted to worship and honor Jesus because they knew that he was the chosen son of God. And when they mentioned this to King Herod, they were troubled and they were intimidated. But let, let's also remember that the angel came already. The angel had already came to Joseph in his dream to let him know that this was happening. And when we read in Matthew chapter two, we will see how, you know, King Herod, he actually wanted to stop all of this from happening, but they actually received a warning from God in their dream. So they wanted to worship and honor Jesus. But when they mentioned to King Herod, all of this, he was troubled because he was intimidated that they wanted to worship and honor Jesus. So he had the wise men search for Jesus and he wanted them to pretend like they he, he wanted to pretend like he wanted to worship and honor Jesus, but he actually wanted to destroy Jesus. So the wise men, when they saw, when they finally reached Jesus and they were able to go to him, they did not reveal to King Herod where they found Jesus because that's what King Herod wanted. It was revealed to the wise men in their dream that they should not go back to King Herod because he had this whole plan to destroy Jesus. So this is another way that God was speaking to his people, letting them know through a warning in their dream that they should not do something. And a similar, okay, no problem. God bless you. So a similar thing followed with Joseph, you know, an angel came to him in his dream and told him to flee to Egypt because King Herod wanted to destroy Jesus. And, you know, Joseph, he listened, he left. So in Matthew 2, 13 through 15, it says, this is the flight to Egypt. So it says, when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, rise, take the child and his mother. So now this is explaining the interaction of the dream. So it says, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he arose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. 
out of Egypt I call my son. So this is going to be the end, guys. We have made it to the end. I know this is definitely a longer Bible study. Normally, we are on for just about an hour, but I believe that a lot of this revelation was just so, so powerful, and these are things that we need to ponder on. I am going to give you guys the workbook and... Also, if you want it to be emailed, I can email it to you. But I truly hope that you were able to gain a better understanding of your dreams through this lesson that we have went over today. Because again, our like understanding our dreams can be a complicated thing. But God, he has also given us the ability to receive that revelation. And we have to be patient with God, we have to understand that even though God may not give us the revelation immediately and right away, he is still going to reveal it some way, somehow, because again, for nothing is secret that will not be revealed and nothing is hidden that will not be known and come to light. So God, he's always going to show us what he wants to show us. And when the time comes, whether we truly fully understand or not, the revelation that we receive is part of the story of what God was showing us in our dream. So I know this was long, but I'm going to open up the floor for any questions that you guys may have. And uh, yeah, I think that's that's pretty much it. Does anyone have any questions? Any questions, any questions? You could either unmute or raise your hand. But if, if no one has any questions, then we will just end it off here. And I hope that you guys enjoy the rest of your weekend. God bless you guys. Amen. Amen. God bless you. I really, I really hope that even through this, that God would continue to give you guys more revelation as you continue to have dreams. Because I know that many of many of us in here are dreamers, prophetic dreamers. Amen. Amen. And when God gives us these prophetic dreams, sometimes it's just so confusing. I used to think that when I had a dream, I had to know the meaning and understand it immediately. But that's really not the case at all. And I think through these these um, biblical studies that we did today, we can see that it is also okay to go to your brother or sister in Christ that you know that has the gift of dream interpretation and ask them, what did the Lord show me through this? What is it that I'm supposed to be doing with this information that God has shown me? So thank you guys so much. God bless you. We will be back on next Saturday. And have, enjoy the rest of your day. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. I love you guys. Father, we thank you so much for all that you have done for us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Bye, guys. Okay.